Some of the other things we can use for high availability are uh, things like server clusters. Now we've talked a lot about storage and what we can do to keep our storage highly available for us to uh, the different uh, options that we have. But we also have to have that front end, the thing that people are connecting to that are accessing the storage, and that of course is our servers. Uh, we can also look at some other solutions that might be separate from clusters or even uh, you know, work with clusters, which is uh, network load balancing. Now I like to think of network load balancing as scaling out our connectivity options to be able to uh, handle more traffic and more users. Uh, but it also does give us some high availability as well. And, uh, and then of course we'll look at uh, some of the solutions that failover clustering can give us uh, by implementing it within our network. When we take a look at uh, clustering, the idea is to have two or more devices that appear to be a single one. And so I'm going to have server one and server two that are independent uh, 2008 servers, but they have this uh, cluster set up in that they are talking to each other through what we call this heartbeat. Now the heartbeat is simply our way of detecting whether or not our neighbor has died, right? No heartbeat, they're gone, and so, so we can figure out who's going to take over. Now the idea is, in a cluster, is that only one of these two is active at one time. Now what does active mean? Well, as I build up this cluster and uh, talk about uh, some of the ways in which we can use it, uh, you, you'll kind of get the idea of exactly why active and passive and how it's going to all come together. Um, but the short story is active means this is the server that responds to the users. Now the clients, right, these are our users up here. The clients are trying to access our servers and uh, you know they see the address that they were given uh, probably through DNS of uh, whatever server it is they're trying to reach. Maybe it's an email server. I'll just stick with, uh, with uh, Exchange. So uh, you know the user wants to send their email off and they uh, send it to the uh, Exchange server. The Exchange server uh, uh, gets an uh, address resolved by DNS as the, this address that shows uh, XX1.10. It doesn't really matter what the IP address is for the illustration. Um, and so they send, um, you know, whatever that application, in this case it was an email application, they send it to that virtual address. Now that virtual address is actually going to be responded to by the active uh, member of this cluster. Uh, it will handle that information, take care of sending the email or retrieving email and all that sort of stuff, uh, give the appropriate responses back. And if uh, the next client over here wants to send an email, they're going to send it to that same virtual address that you see. It goes to that same active uh, server, and it responds back as well. Uh, so it's handling all of that workload of these uh, connections. Um, that's why it's the active one. It's doing its job. Now, in that process, if this server died and, uh, and then the heartbeat stopped, then the one that was passive would take over the role as active. And it now, when the email request comes in, it would be sent to the new active machine, and it could respond and do everything appropriately without the client seeing any downtime. Client would know that they still went to the same virtual address they got the response. Now, uh, how do we make sure that uh, the data you know, like your email and everything else that uh, Server 1 knew about, how do we know that Server 2 has the same copy of information? That's why clusters have to have shared data. They have to have a drive that they both have access to for whatever service they're clustering. In this case, that means all the email are stored here. So even though Server 1 went down, it still stored its information on that same shared data that Server 2 has available uh, access to and uh, that way we don't see any loss and uh, we have this uh, uptime. So now even when I lost a uh, server itself, uh, we still had things running and that gave us that high availability. We're going to uh, install the feature this time of uh, the network load balancing. So I'm going to open up server manager as you saw and I'm already selected on features. So I'm going to go ahead and click on add features and from the add features I'm going to choose the network load balancing. Now you may or may not see pop-ups depending on uh, what's already been installed um, as far as things that are running. Uh, here it is uh, telling us a little bit about what NLB is supposed to be so we'll click next and uh, we'll confirm it that it's, uh, it appears to be working. We'll do the quick install. Uh, you notice that features are not as uh, intense as far as questions uh, that you get with uh, roles. 
um, you know, features are really supporting um, some of the other roles that we have, and certainly network load balancing could be added as a support, you could say, in uh, being able to provide uh, a virtual address that represents many, many servers and uh, helps us in balancing our traffic. Anyway, we'll let that, uh, that uh, go on down, and then we're going to, uh, uh, there we go, successful installed. Uh, we're going to close that down. We'll minimize our server manager, and uh, we'll take a look and see if uh, when I go to administrative tools, if I see net work load balancing, I do. I see the manager. But you know, I uh, should talk a little more about command line. Let's see if that uh, works. If I do nlbmgr.exe and hit enter, I know. It's going to do the same thing. It's going to uh, open up the uh, manager either way I do it. So there it is, the network load balancing manager. Now, um, from here, Let's see if I have anything to expand, if I can make this a little bit better, maybe just make the full screen there. Uh, here it uh, is set up to talk about these network load balancing uh, clusters. And, um, and of course, we really haven't uh, made anything, right? We, we just installed it uh, and we have it all ready to go. So I, I should right click it and say, let's make a new cluster. Now uh, here it says I have to connect to one host that is gonna be part of the new cluster and then select the uh, cluster interface. But, well, that's where uh, we're going to have a little bit of a tougher time because um, we don't have uh, all but just this one host. So I'm going to connect uh, to ourselves. And um, here it says, okay, there's the one network adapter. So I'll say, yep, that's the one we're going to do. We'll click on next and uh, priority. Now uh, here again, a unique host identifier. Uh, I'll just leave the uh, priority as one. And uh, that's the dedicated IP address that we have on that network card. And um, now from here, uh, the default state, what's the initial state? Is it going to be stopped, suspended, started? Uh, we're going to go ahead and leave it as started. The idea is that it should be uh, ready to go as soon as we uh, start, um, uh, start the service up. Anyway, so we'll leave it as it is. I'll click on next. Now we need a cluster IP. Now a cluster IP is the one that uh, is going to represent all of the servers in the background. And uh, I like that it's IP6 ready. Uh, so we're going to use uh, and it's, you know, an address, and it's generally going to be on the same uh, interface, or the same subnet, I should say, as the interface that's connected to it. And uh, so I'm picking uh, an address of 100. And uh, I could add an IP address uh, if I wanted to. Uh, also, though, with IP addresses, you can use uh, uh, a variety of different types. Uh, here, link local, site local, and global. Um, but uh, uh, if I actually created my own IP address uh, at, uh, here, then it would either be a site local or global address. Uh, anyway, so I don't see full support for all of IP6 yet. And that's okay. We're still not quite there, ready to, to go. So I'll stick with the IP4 configuration. Now, uh, if I did, you, you might have said to yourself, well, look, it looks like I can't have both. Well, you know what? I, I can add another cluster, a cluster address and generate right, and IP6. It's just I can't do it on the same GUI screen. So I'm going to take that IP6 address off of there. All right. Uh, next uh, question here is the uh, cluster IP configuration. So we've got that. Uh, if needed, a full internet name uh, that we're going to use. And uh, I'll just call it my test NLB. And uh, uh, that's the virtual MAC address that I'm going to use. Now, uh, the virtual MAC is... Uh, in response to what we need with Ethernet. Um, you know, the hosts are going to try to reach to this um, virtual address that I created, but the, the switches that are connecting them still need to know the MAC address, and I have to make sure that my MAC address is unique uh, and not going to conflict with anybody else's real MAC address. So anyway, so I've got that. And then we have to decide, are we uh, operating in unicast, multicast, uh, or IGMP? Well, we'll stick with unicast, and we'll click on Next. And uh, now we have uh, the defined uh, port rules. Now here it says TCP and UDP traffic uh, directed to the cluster will arrive on any ports 0 through 65, 535, balanced across all the multiple members of the cluster according to the load weight of each member. Okay. Um, now, right now it's just basically saying that any communication to this cluster address on any of these ports that we're going to redirect it to the... Uh, servers that are supporting us in the uh, back end um, to those same destination ports. 
you know, maybe I'm only doing internet traffic port 80. If that was the case, I would, I, I, by the way, I highlighted it, I clicked on edit, and, uh, and I can change it to uh, port 80. And uh, click on OK. And now, um, you know, if you reach that actual network load balancing's virtual address, and you're on anything other than port 80, um, your traffic's pretty much going to die because I'm only going to forward or balance uh, that traffic that's on port 80. Maybe I need to also balance um, with uh, port 443 for any of those connections you make through uh, the secure socket layer. So I'll set that one in there as well. Okay, so uh, you can see what we're doing is we're just uh, restricting the uh, destination addresses, right? Because uh, they're coming to us as the destination. So I'm just uh, uh, kind of restricting it to um, what's appropriate for what kind of service I'm doing load balancing with. All right, so now I've done that, I'm going to click on Finish. And uh, now I've got this uh, one host anyway set up with uh, network load balancing. And... Uh, of course, uh, here you can kind of see the uh, little steps of, uh, of uh, we'll call them job steps as they're going through here. Um, you know, to really do this, I should have uh, hopefully had an actual different server that would have been one of the clients I'm connecting to. And of course, another server in the back end to actually load balance with. But uh, I've shown you the settings of uh, how, you, uh, how you would go through this uh, process. You would have just added the other host machines at the time when I added this local machine and uh, still gone through the same uh, types of, uh, of configurations that I just showed you here. And now, of course, there I've got um, my two port rules for that cluster, and, uh, and we're ready to go. I'm going to now load balance officially uh, to this one back-end server, which is mine. I'm kind of laughing about that because that's not load balancing. I'm just going to get all the load. Again, if you, when you created the cluster, you would have had the opportunity to uh, add in other um, servers in the... Uh, in the back end that we're going to be receiving this traffic. But it is uh, pretty easy to uh, set this up. Don't forget that priority was made available to you. As I said, you can add kind of that uh, uh, priority and even weight to uh, those servers so that uh, some might get more work than others. Uh, whatever it is you need to set up so that it uh, works with uh, not only your hardware solution, but with your uh, network solution as well.